So we wanted to, we added a, a moment on the agenda for folks to, who are new to the authority to, to, to introduce themselves as we're, we are hiring, um, uh, we're starting to hire some, some folks or wanted to, to, uh, to introduce some of the folks who are new to, to us, um, if not new to you. Um, so I will ask, um, so I see um, uh, Shani Jones, who is the newest, uh, the newest person, uh, Lisa and Nika and Paul, do you guys want to just take a minute to introduce yourselves? I will, absolutely. Hi, y'all. Thank you so much for having me in this space. My name is Nika, and I use she, her pronouns. Um, I come to the authority as the program specialist, um, where I'll be supporting um, contracts and working with our providers um, and moving and grooving and, and, and moving things along. Um, a little bit about myself is um, I come with, with lived experience. I once was a young adult um, who was unhoused. And so I'm very humbled to be in this position and to be doing this work. It's very near and dear to my heart. Um, and yeah, that's a little bit about me. And I look forward to learning a lot more about y'all as we move, uh, move forward together. I can go next. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Shawnee Jones, and I'm um, serving as the procurement coordinator. I came over to the authority from the city of Seattle. Um, I have an organizing background. This work is near and dear to my heart, and I just um, I'm thankful to be in this space with you all and just uh, learn and grow and work alongside of you all. Thank you. Hi everyone, um, it's so nice to be here. Um, I'm Lisa Gustavison. I have had the honor and privilege to work alongside many of the folks on the call and um, on homelessness issues for many, many years. I'm working alongside the program team um, and uh, come most recently from the city of Seattle, but also have experience working in the community, including the faith community. Hello, Pastor. <laughs> Um, and so just really thankful and happy to be here. Um, looking forward to reconnecting with many of you. All of you, sorry. <laughs> Hi, I'm Paul Tan. I'm with the, um, the sub-regional planning team in my area is South King County. Um, but really um, as a planning team um, member, um, I'm happy to be someone who can listen and outreach and help build that map of um, not just service providers and government entities, but folks in the community, um, uh, all of us, um, and bring people together. Um, so I'm really thankful and happy to be here with you all. Um, and I look forward to um, the excitement that this new entity is bringing. Thank you. I think that was uh, I think that was the folks that we had um, with uh, with the authority. We're still uh, still pretty small team. So the big news we need to share is we have a new staff for, for our group. I believe it's Catherine. Maria has moved on to other work. Catherine, can you introduce yourself? Hi, my name is Katherine Wells. I come to the authority from the city of Seattle as the senior administrative assistant. And um, my pronouns are she, hers. Um, I'm excited to do this work. It's very near and dear to my heart also, um, coming from a background of homelessness myself. So I'm excited to get started. And I just ask for grace as I learn these functions to carry on these meetings. Thank you. Welcome on board. So are we ready to move to public comment? Uh, 
if you want to do introductions um, for folks who haven't yet introduced themselves. Oh, that's right. Yeah, we just did the roll call. Yeah, introductions is good. I'll start. Listen, I didn't get a chance to say anything. So, you know, it wasn't done. I'm confused. I didn't understand the question or maybe the statement. But I think the hope is, is that the board actually, those who may not have gotten to introduce themselves have the opportunity to do so. I can go, I'm a little bit late. Apologies, everybody, uh, Jesse Benet, um, currently the deputy director at um, PDA, um, soon to be purpose, dignity, action, and not the public defender association that doesn't provide public defense. <laughs> um, excited to be here. Sorry, having a little bit of a personnel issue. That's why I'm late, but I am here and focused and excited to join you guys. My pronouns are he, him. Hi, I'm Christina, and I am um, representing unha my unhoused neighbors. Hi, I'm Jennifer Bowen. I use she, her pronouns. I'm a former member of the Youth Advisory Board or Youth Action Board. Um, very happy. Hope. Um, bring some good energy to this. Thank you. I'm Kelly Brown, senior pastor at Plymouth Church, United Church of Christ in downtown Seattle and a member of the advisory board. Grateful to be here today. Good. Hi, I'm Karen Taylor and I need um, technology. Um, Wi-Fi stability, I guess. I don't know what it is, but, you know, I want to be here. I want to be present. But if I can't hear you guys, I don't know how. Okay. Thank you for that, Karen. We're currently working to get folks Wi-Fi hotspots and laptops. Uh, for both the name on the board. Thank you, Jonathan. I'm Sherry Tillman, and I am the uh, intake manager for King County slash Mary's Place uh, for family shelters as well as the advisory. I'm a member of the, on the advisory board. Um, hi, I'm <laughs> oh, sorry, Lisa, please. You're good, Ben. Um, I'm Louise. I use they them pronouns. Um, I was on the County Youth Action Board when they were still all home. Um, and now I'm a student stability fellow. Hi, I'm Ben Mix. Um, I use he and him. Uh, I work for United Healthcare uh, during my day job. Um, and I'm you know, really interested in particular in uh, connections with, with healthcare services and systems that we can bring uh, to people experiencing homelessness. Hi, I'm Tamara Bauman, uh, she, her pronouns. I am a member of, well, I have lived experience of homelessness and domestic violence. I'm a rapid rehousing advocate at Solid Ground um, and a huge, huge advocate for the emergency housing vouchers for my clients. Thank you. Hello all, my name is Brianna Franco. I use she, her pronouns and uh, I have lived experience in homelessness as well, um, as well as participation in the youth action board currently. Okay. Hello, everybody. Night Gun. I'm the director of programs at Chief Seattle Club. 
Um, nice to see everybody. Are we just jumping in at will? Yes, everyone that wants to do so. You know enough about me, but I'm just darn glad to be here. Um, I have to go pick up all my new meds in a few minutes. So um, do we have enough of a quorum if I have to leave this August body? We do. Okay, so will you please excuse me? I, I hate to miss this. I love being a dedicated member to such a good cause, and I'm really enjoying getting to know everybody. Um, I'm, I'm a she, her pronoun person. I, I love to um, be a lived experience coalition person. I'm a, a retired psychiatric nurse, and I've been a drug addict on the street as well. And um, I come to you with lots of experience. Um, I like to say I'm, I'm, I'm miles wide, but not very deep. So... <laughs> I bring an open heart to you and uh, from you, I hope to learn. So um, thank you. Thank you. And thank you for the offer of support. I really appreciate that, you guys. Namaste. Wishing you well, Christy. Thank so better Shanae. soon. Thank you, Shanae. Oh, and I just to let you know, I did the four-day diversion training that Shanae and um, Karen put on and several other people from the... Um, building changes and it was fabulous and if you haven't been to it and you get the opportunity to do so it really it really was a team building experience it really helped me to learn not only about them but about myself and about how even though I'm not a housing provider I can be you know I can be more effective in this role here so thank you good stuff We don't have anyone, do we have anyone else? Shanae Colston, she, her pronouns, black American. And Marvin Futrell, uh, I get the wonderful job of working with Shanae and putting together these agendas. Uh, hopefully we've caught everyone's um, Request and we can address some today and some may be moved on to our November meeting, but I look forward to continue to work with folks. So if we're ready, we could probably head towards public comment so that we can get into the nuts and bolts of the meeting. If you would like to make public comment, um, you can put your name in the chat. You should be able to chat with everyone at this point so we can see your name. Um. Again, the chat is enabled for everyone. So I will just give one more minute um, to make sure that if you wanna put public comment, you can put your name in the chat. Okay. At this time, there are no names in the chat um, for public comment, and there are no hands raised to give public comment. Thank you. So can we um, monitor that? Oh, sorry, Peter. Can we no, monitor, go ahead. Can we monitor that? And if folks do uh, want to make public comment, we can check it, but then push on. Uh, with the meeting, with the agenda? Yep. I think Peter, I'll go ahead and monitor the chat. Thank you. Okay. That's great, thank you. 
So um, the next item on the agenda is about uh, CNC roles and responsibilities. And I, you know, I, I had given, we, we've talked about this a bit over the past few months. I had given a presentation at the uh, implementation board, which, uh, which Marvin asked me to share back with, uh, with the group. So just to talk through um, sort of roles and responsibilities. What is the continuum of care? What are the, what's the role for a continuum of care board, which is what the advisory committee is? And then what are the other sort of uh, uh, bodies that a continuum of care uh, has? And then, you know, also sort of how do they play with the King County Regional Homelessness Authority and with its governing board? So I, I wanted to just sort of walk through the structure. It's a little, it's a little complicated, uh, unfortunately, but just want to kind of kind of walk through this. So, Naomi, uh, thank you for running the uh, running the PowerPoint. So, a continuum of care it had so under the uh, the rules for receiving homeless assistance funding from HUD, which is you know the the successor grants from the McKinney Bento grants. We have a responsibility to establish a continuum of care board. Uh, when All Home was the continuum of care lead for the King County uh, continuum of care, it had its coordinating board and was, you know, it played that role in the, uh, in the establishment of the interlocal agreement for the King County Regional Homelessness Authority, which is intended to be and is the, the continuum of care lead. There was the establishment at that time in, in the interlocal agreement. And so, you know, in those governing documents, the creation of the advisory committee, which would take the role on of continuum of care board. So it is the lead entity for the continuum of care and has specific responsibilities. Next slide. Um, you know, just a there were a few, re, you know, obviously, you know, I, I don't want to, don't mean to go through the whole history of why the King County Regional Homelessness was authority was, you know, homelessness authority was created. You, you guys, you know, were here for that. You know it better, better in fact than I. But I will say that having led the Los Angeles Homeless Services Authority for five years, which is a, a much longer established uh, body of exactly this kind, bringing together a city and county. It is a really challenging space and it's a really important one for homeless services to be brought together because cities and counties have different resources, they have different constituencies, they have different priorities and it's, it, it is often the case that they're not in alignment. So the establishment of the King County Regional Homelessness Authority to bring together both of those funding streams and both of those sort of interest sets and focuses with the HUD priority, with the HUD funding um, is the goal, and that is one of the roles that the, the uh, advisory committee will play is, is, is establishing the sort of backbone for and uh, the continuum the continuum board. It integrates those um, those resources. It allows us to look across all of the different um, resource bases and to align them, and it makes sure that there's a strong connection between the funding that we have and the policy priorities that the federal government has established and what we're doing locally, which is to establish the primacy of lived experience and the guidance of an equity-based decision-making framework. Next slide, please. Okay, so the primary functions of this body are to um, advise the governing committee and the implementation board. So the King County Regional Homelessness Authority itself has a governance structure. It, as an agency, it is itself answerable to two boards. One of them is the implementation board that is more of a hands-on month-to-month uh, uh, -month body. It functions in, in close connection with the, uh, with the management of the, of the organization. It is appointed members. They are nominated by um, certain by certain positions, but also by the city and the county. In addition to that, we have the governing committee, which meets on a quarterly basis and is comprised of elected officials. So it has a certain set of responsibilities under the interlocal agreement, particularly approving budgets. The implementation uh, board has more of a hands-on role. It's more in terms of, uh, you know, for example, recommending the budgets, but they work together as 
you know, the, uh, the governing bodies for the King County Regional Homelessness Authority itself. The King County Regional Homelessness Authority is the uh, continuum of care lead and will have responsibility uh, in, you know, on a, on a forward-going basis for implementing all of the, the HUD requirements and for managing the HUD grants. Those are in a process of transition from our partners at, the, at King County and, and Seattle. Uh, Kate Speltz and Eileen Denham are here from King County and from, uh, from the city of Seattle. They're gonna be talking about the HUD uh, no, no uh, I'm still I'm still working on it, but I got it right that time. They changed the term from a notice of funding availability, a NOFA, which has been the term forever, to a notice of funding opportunity, a NOFO. So I'm still wrapping my head around the difference between, they're the same thing, but the, the, the word is different. And then the other thing that's, um, that is a, is a responsibility of the advisory committee is to keep the, you know, the, the governing committee and implementation board um, a pro, you know, aware of things that are political in nature and for which you don't have a decision-making authority. So raising up those other issues that may, that may intersect with the work and that, that you, know, you, you recognize as being uh, appropriately uh, salient and important to those, to those folks to, to keep an eye on. As the continuum of care board, there are, can you, can you go back one, sorry. Um, so if you look at the bullets here, on the right-hand side, there are sort of four areas of responsibility. One is HMIS. Every continuum of care has to, can, has to maintain an HMIS system. We use uh, bid focus as clarity here, of course. Uh, somebody has to, has to monitor that and make sure that it is, it is functioning and that it has rules and it is appropriate. That's a responsibility uh, under the, under the uh, continuum. The second responsibility is that every continuum has to operate a coordinated entry system. That is, a, that is a local responsibility. Here it's been implemented as coordinated entry for all. And I've heard from, you know, essentially everybody that uh, we, we need to take a, a hard look at and reimagine re re the way that uh, coordinated entry functions here. So that's a role responsibility that we're all going to have to take on. But in, in uh, establishment of essentially the, the focus on that, we locally there is a continuum, you know, a, a coordinated entry for all policy advisory committee, which was set up as a, as a, as a committee of the board to, to look at that specific function. All of the continuums have a responsibility to apply for the NOFO now, NOFA then, to uh, renew the grants and apply for new money. So that is something that we're gonna discuss, but that's an annual process and there's a rank order and, and other things that have to come in for that. Um, and then of course, somebody has to actually do the, app, the collaborative application. So Sherry, I see your hand. All right, so it might, you know, I don't know. You probably, I know you just read this and you went over it. So I'm just trying to understand cause I have to like, understand so yeah you know just trying to get it so yeah. when these policies and advisory roles um and it talked about the second one it's, it's like the forward for approval any committee recommendations that identifies as sensitive or political in nature or for what for which it does not have decision making authority a little confused about that can you just kind of yeah. break that more in a kind of like a term i'm gonna understand yeah 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 so like, let me give you a free instance right so one thing that this body does not have authority over, but might have a view on would be the uh, local uh, municipal enforcement actions on homeless encampments, for example. Let's just take that as an example. It's a very politically hot topic. It's an intersection between municipal responsibilities for public health, sanitation, rights of way, and response to constituent complaints, which they also have a responsibility for, and the needs of people who are experiencing homelessness and don't have any place else to live. And this has been one of those sort of flashpoints across communities across, you know, across America. It's often one of those, one of those areas that is very challenging for uh, cities to manage. 
And many of them have taken uh, stances that are more law enforcement and more uh, sanitation enforcement aggressive. And so one of the positions that HUD has taken over time has, to, has been to look at the roles and responsibilities where criminal enforcement is being used uh, to, uh, to address homelessness encampments. This is an area that where the continuum of care you know, board, the advisory committee itself would not have a responsibility. And yet it might have a, it might have advice that it would want to, you know, put back out and would, it might say like, okay, HUD is saying, this is an area that's really challenging for communities and that have, that take a more law enforcement associated stance are going to be at a disadvantage when you're applying for new monies from HUD, we need to be very mindful of that. So that might be an example of the kind of, of the kind of thing that you would want to think about. There might be, so there might be areas where um, the community would have, you know, or for example, uh, land use decisions where, you know, the, you know, the key problem that is driving homelessness. There are many different drivers, of course, but the, the most crucial one is housing affordability. If communities are overzoned for single family dwellings, that makes land and housing more expensive and it makes the cost of living go up from a housing perspective. So the committee, it is not, you know, we don't have authority over that. Land use is not in our purview, but it is a key driver for uh, housing affordability and a key driver for why things are uh, so expensive and why people are, are driven in homelessness because there's not affordability at that local level. So the committee might have, uh, you know, recommendations that are associated with, you know, land use or, or things like that. Oh, and I'm talking about over time, like not right this minute, but as things might come up that intersect with homelessness or with new challenges that we're facing, um, there might be issues that we would want to raise that are not directly in our responsibility set that, but we have a, you know, we have some ideas about, and that would be the responsibility of the, you know, or that would be among the kinds of things that the, that the, uh, that the advisory committee would, would you know, might recommend to the, to the governing uh, board. Um, does that, does that help you? It does. Thank you so much. Okay. Absolutely. Okay. Next slide. So right now, uh, the committee structure, as you voted, you have two co-chairs. Um, this body is uh, that it meets on, you know, on a, on a fixed schedule on a monthly basis. We are uh, right now we are engaged in the application. There's an open application, a NOFO uh, application with HUD right now, which is being um, which is being worked on uh, by our partners at the city and the county. Uh, and they're going to like they're going to, as I mentioned earlier, they're going to present on on sort of the facts of that. Um, but, you know, that's the structure that we've got for the committee right now. It has uh, delegated responsibility or delegated authority to the coordinated entry for all policy advisory committee, the CEA PAC, as the body to look at uh you know, coordinated entry for all. And again, that's an area where I think we're all, you know, we're going to need to put some attention in the future because, you know, I'm, I'm just never, <laughs> I've not talked to anybody who's fully satisfied with our implementation of coordinated entry and candor, you know, which is no, you know, no comment on anybody who's in that team. I think they're, they're doing a great job with what they've got, but locally the, the, the support for that implementation was just not very rich. So we got to, we got to rethink the way we do that. The other, the other um, committee that was established um, was the System Performance Committee, and that had a responsibility to look at, or has a responsibility to look at, sort of evaluation of how the, the performance of our programs is doing, and to measure that. So there's some, you know, discussion as to whether this, uh, what, you know, what, what might succeed that committee, um, and, and where it might go, but it's also, a, a, you know, one of the things that we need to look at. We are required to make, you know, measure our, our, our system performance, make sure that our programs are delivering what they're, what they're supposed to. 
Um, and under the system performance committee is the uh, responsibility for, for, for HMIS. So those are the, those are, that's the, this is the sort of current committee structure. Um, you, you know, I will say that in Los Angeles, we had a separate committee that looked at uh, CES, our, our implementation of coordinate entry is the coordinate entry system, CES. And it was helpful to have a separate body so that it could operate all the time. During the NOFO season, uh, often the attention gets drawn into the NOFO. You, got, you have to pay attention to those things and it might drag you off the topics that, you know, so it's helpful to have somebody focused on coordinated entry and those policies, somebody focused on HMIS and those things and system. So it's, it is helpful to have, um, have these committees. Um, next slide. Or I guess that was the last slide. Okay, so that's the you know the sort of basic overview. I will say that you know one of the things that I think is really powerful about this body is a you know it has an extraordinary depth of lived experience and provider experience in it, which is you know an unparalleled resource in just knowledge and facts about about the current structure and of, of what our continuum looks like, but also the experience of people you know, who, who are uh, both experiencing homelessness and have, have worked through um, and are maybe now housed, but have great experience of working with our provider base. We have a responsibility of a responsive uh, you know, system of, of addressing the needs of people experiencing homelessness in, in um, Seattle King County that the lived expertise that you all bring is one of the, the richest resources that, that, that we can have in terms of building out the knowledge of how to, how to rethink the way that we wanna do business. So, you know, I think I see this body as a key resource for addressing, you know, not just the HUD requirements, which is a sort of a minimum, but also to gain access to all the knowledge that you have and the, the advice that you have and as we build out, you know, a new infrastructure and we think about the best ways to, to reconfigure, um, you know, the, the, uh, the way that we're doing business in, in uh, Seattle, King County. I'm happy to answer any questions about, you know, the sort of, you know, structure of that and um, the formal roles. Okay. So really quickly, Peter, uh, yeah. it's not a, it's not an immediate uh, request, but uh, I think as people digest or folks that uh, have comprised the committee, now that we're on board, yeah. uh, some sort of update on where the coordinated entry policy advisory committee committees are at, especially with the uh, changeover from separate spots where it's done to the authority would be of use and Great. the system performance. I know it hasn't met much, however, uh, be interesting to see how that's being developed and, and how to address some of the concerns that uh, have been expressed, at least to me, by the uh, committee members okay. for transparency. Okay, great. So um, I will ask folks. So there are a few folks who are on both. I think um, um, Shanae is on um, is on the uh, the CEA pack. And so one of the things I'll do is I'll ask for the CEA pack. Yes, to, I am. Yeah, to task somebody with with reporting in and kind of giving an overview of where things are. Okay. So Shanae, let's take that back to the to the to the pack. Okay. Well, we'll just tell them, right? Somebody will volunteer. There's plenty of able bodies to do that. And we'll just let them know, like, this is the request. This is what we need you to stand up and show up and do. And um, I'm pretty confident that we'll have a, a someone volunteer, if not more than one. Great. Um, and I will talk to uh, Christina McHugh uh, with regard to the system performance. Mm -hmm. So uh, the follow-up yeah. was, uh, uh, what do we know where uh, on the system performance committee? And the is there a way for folks to actually be able to uh, see what the interlocal agreement actually is also saying for you know to addressing our structure and 
what we'll be looking at and the hows and whys. Um, we, re, we asked to see the interlocal agreement, I think last month, but I think there was some concern on, yeah, I don't know. I think we didn't get it. So I don't know if folks have a pathway in which to go read it online, but I think it would be useful so that we're all working from. Yeah. Know, so, all right, I'm going to post the link. Here it is. You know, it's, here's the link and I'll, I'll send that out to, uh, I'll send that out to the committee as well. Okay. So it's, it's up on our website. If you, um, you know, I mean, I'll be candid. It's not the most approachable document. It's written in, you know, it's, it's, you know, a municipal document, but, um, but, you know, it, it, um, it certainly, it spells out, um, you know, the, the establishment for, uh, for this body. So it, it's there and I'll send the, I'll send the link out. Okay. Good stuff. Thank you. Um, okay, hearing no other questions, maybe we'll move on to um, the next topic, unless there's anything else any, anybody wants to ask about the, the sort of formal structure. Okay. Um, so Kate, uh, Kate Spells is with, the, uh, with King County and Eileen Denham are with, uh, is with the uh, city of Seattle and they're working on our uh, NOFO application. No foe, no foe. I'm, I'm getting that. <laughs> okay. Thanks, Peter. Again, I'm Kate Spelts with King County. My colleague, Eileen Denham, is here as well. I don't know if I have the capacity to share my screen. I believe I do. And what I am actually going to share with you here is off of the KCRHA website. This is from... Uh, the notes from one of our previous meetings with you. Again, we're here to talk about the Continuum of Care NOFO application, which we are in the middle of right now. And today we're really just here uh, to give you a quick status update and kind of let you know when we're going to need to bring something back to you again. So Eileen, do you want to uh, speak to this timeline? tell you where we are. Um, so I'm not sure exactly when we came before you, uh, how far along we were in the process, but we have held two um, application workshops for our renewals. We have renewals that contract directly with Seattle and King County. Um, and we have some that contract directly with HUD for their funding. So we had a general workshop and then we had a direct grantee workshop uh, right now, we are preparing all of our, what we call Exhibit 2 applications, but essentially they are all the renewal project applications. Um, those, so those applications have been received. Um, all of those applications are under review or in some level of preparation. Um, we will be meeting this week with, um, I think last time we came to you, we talked about um, funding available for bonus funding. So we have money for a DV bonus, um, almost $1.9 million. Um, we are, of course, going to be seeking that funding and um, are meeting with, um, uh, we came up with a strategy and we are meeting with the candidates, um, which really is just going to be an expansion of an existing project um, because because of how, where we are right now. So we're working on the DV bonus. Um, we have some candidates for the COC bonus, uh, which is about $2.4 million. Some of those projects were ones that were already vetted and approved by the COC in the 2019 process, but didn't get funded. So we are hoping that we will still be able to include them in our rank order. They will still be viable. Um, and we are also working with um, our um, existing process that reviews and vets uh, permanent supportive housing projects serving the chronically homeless, which is the priority for the COC bonus funds. So we're doing that. Um, HUD's internal deadlines, I think we went over those at our last meeting. Um, they expect us to have all applications submitted for review within 30 days of the NOFO due date, which we established as October 15th, we've met that deadline. Um, we are very close actually to being able to finalize most of those renewal projects. 
Um, we have to have final decisions made. We have to know what our rank order is going to look like. That is almost finished. We just need to wait and see what our new projects are going to look like. So we will be coming back to you um, at the end of October with the final preliminary rank order. Um, we need your review um, and affirmation of that rank order. And then pretty much um, right after that, we will be taking that preliminary rank order that's been approved to, I call it the community, but we will be taking it back to all of the projects and proposers that are included in our application. We will be presenting the results to them um, going over kind of like what we have done with you, um, our complete process, our rationale for decisions, why projects rank the way they did. Um, that again is gonna be essentially the last week in October. So you should be looking for um, a meeting invite from Peter. I think the last day we can do it would be October 28th. Um, and then at the same time as we're doing all of this, we are also writing the major planning document, uh, which is really where we get all of our points and which would have then allow us to fund as many projects as possible in what we call exhibit two or the program proposals that are attached to our consolidated application. Um, so that's kind of where we are. That's our update. Kate, do you have anything to add to that? Only two things. One, to uh, again note that, and Peter will be talking with you about this, we will want to come back to you with the proposed rank order uh, early the week um, of the last week of October um, as a key deadline that we need to meet for our HUD process. Um, and the other thing I want to say, Eileen and I have a COC application process related meeting at and so uh, we are going to be leaving you. So we are not available right now to answer any questions. Peter, if there are any, we ask that you answer them as you can or collect them and we will uh, respond to them as needed. Thanks all. All right. Thank you. Thank you. So does anyone have uh, any uh, questions or concerns or things we may want to address before we hit the last week of October? So we'll, I could we'll take, I'll take the lead. I mean, if, I, if it helps to get it kick started, um, it's interesting that things have happened since we knew about the bonus funding uh, would like to hear a little bit more about the strategy in which our fine folks who are putting together this application took to address it, how the decision was made to go with an already existing program. Was it a time constraint that we couldn't find other programs that might also better fit uh, the funding stream under domestic violence and uh, for both, for all three areas actually, but for the extra funding that's coming in. Uh, we heard about it, but we didn't, uh, there's been very little dialogue about how, what approach was going to be taken for yeah, security. Yeah, we ain't talked funds. about none of it. Thank you. We need to have communication, be open again, transparency. That's what Marvin and me have been saying from the beginning. We just want open dialogue to be transparent. Things are moving. We don't get informed about them unless we're snooping around, right? And so we just want to be knowing in, in the know. So the the uh, the NOFAs the the so there's there are bonus money for domestic violence is available for um, for rapid rehousing or for a uh, transitional rapid rehousing grant. And so I think, you know, it, we only had one remaining transitional housing grant that would be a likely applicant for that particular component. Um, and in discussion with them, it was decided that, you know, they would maintain the way they have their structure 
And so basically the only other structure was to, to have it available as, uh, you know, rapid rehousing. So again, you know, you, you're right about the time constraint. There's very little time to, to pull together. Uh, but, you know, we did ask for the, the providers who could participate. So we're going to put forward an application and then uh, provide an opportunity for folks to apply for that funding later on. So basically, we're going to go forward and say like, okay, we, we want to raise our hand and say, yes, we want to take this money and we'll um, provide an opportunity for additional folks to, to participate in that rapid housing grant later on. So there, there is more space for folks to apply for it. We just didn't want to leave it, you know, not apply for every, 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 every nickel that we could. So I guess my, uh, my other question is simply, uh, I know that the pro a lot of the work's already been done, but for Myself and other committee members, we have no idea which 60 programs were selected. We, as you know, we have not seen how that is being worked back in. We're going to see the rank order at the end of the month, but the process in which a rank order is developed is not part of a discussion that folks have had or have some understanding of how decisions are made versus being competitive for the process because um, I think that is always going to be one of the concerns is that uh, we're uh, response-based versus being uh, finance-based in our decision-making. You know, just, just saying, I, I know that I don't know who these folks are. I have not seen any piece of the application other than the boards that have been posted. So um, there is a, sometimes a, a gap in, you know, we'll learn later. I know they say they're going to tell us why certain programs were chosen and others were not. However, the process to get there is, for me at least, one that I have not seen. So I can't advise on it. I can't. I hear the, the um, so the renewal, so the, the 60, the, you know, the 60 grants are, are, is our renewal portfolio, right? And so like, you know, on that side, it's, it's really about like it, uh, lining up the, you know, the ones that we've already got, making sure that everybody a wants to renew that they've, you know, that they've got all their paperwork applied for, but that's, you know, that's essentially just re-upping the you know the the grants that have been awarded um the process that that has taken place locally when there is bonus money or when there's new money available usually the you know and i i don't know if kate or eileen is uh is still here i, I saw that they're not on the panel anymore but i'm not sure whether they have um uh, uh dropped out altogether but um, that there are projects that have been in the pipeline that are working on developing permanent supportive housing. And so one of the things that's always touch and go is making sure that they have operating support when they get close to being complete. And I think that the process in, in recent years has been to align the projects that are already in development with the, with the potential for grants coming up. And that I think is, is, you know, is really part of the, the, the timely, you know, the timely factor of making sure that they're done. So, but I, I will, so one of the things I, I hear from you, you want to, so we're going to spend a lot more time on this in the special meeting that's coming up. Part of it is the, the moment in time where we're in transition between the city and the county and us. And like, you know, it should have, you know, the division of responsibilities we don't quite have the, the responsibility for that yet. We are, they are, you know, like a little shorter staffed than usual. And like, there's just a shorter time of time run. as well as this year, the, the timing for the NOFO was quite different than most people were expecting. But I will, you know, we're gonna set the entire time aside in the next meeting to go through the, you know, all the renewals and the, you know, the rank order that, that you just discussed. Tamara, I saw your hand. Um, I can't see hands. Is she still here? I don't see Tamara anymore. Can you read in the chat, please. 
Um, Peter, so yeah. we have a comment that came through from Jenna. And she says, I think our input on different programs would be valuable as some of us with live experience have directly interacted with different programs. Absolutely. So and one of the things that I really want this body to take on is how do we incorporate that lived experience and how do we get the feedback from people who are in those programs now incorporated into the process of evaluating these programs as we go forward. So there's a, oh, there's Tamara back again. So Tamara, if you still have your, your question, but it, it is really, one of the things that this body is supremely situated to do is to help us build out a way of capturing that lived expertise in the process of evaluating the way these programs you know, are, are stood up both, you know, in terms of the principles that we have and the rest of, um, you know, the rest of the, uh, uh, the, the evaluation of renewals and ranking of renewals. So Tamara, you, you had your hand up earlier. I don't know if you saw your question. Yeah, I um, lost, I lost a connection there for a couple of minutes, but I was just wanted to um, <clears throat> express <laughs> again, a level of frustration in that, um, it, the lack of transparency, and I don't think it's necessarily intentional, but as a member of the continuum of care, a federally mandated entity, when we're left out of conversations around work that is specifically tasked for the COC, it becomes very disempowering, and um, uh, it, it makes me feel pretty jaded about how the system is working for the people who are trying to help the people. And so... Um, it, yeah, I guess that's that's my only comment, and I, I hope that things become more transparent and more uh, smooth and streamlined over time. Uh, but right now, it just kind of feels like there's a disconnect, and that we need to um, we need to figure out a better way to move forward. <clears throat> I really respect and uh, appreciate your comments. Thank you, Tamara. You are welcome. <laughs> I hear I I hear that, and I I will say that this this is this is an unusual year, okay? And like we're we are really in transition, and there's this is you know this is not this is not illustrative of like the way that things are going to work, or you know the the way that we intend them to work. But it is a little bit of a dislocation as we're shifting responsibility from the way the system was to the way the system will be. Okay, the, the other thing that I just wanted to ask is we will have, um, as, was, as was indicated, we will have the need for another meeting at which we'll take, you know, we'll present the, the full list and the, rank, and the ranking and, you know, ask for input from folks. So, um, we'll send out uh, a request to sort of figure out the best time to schedule that. Uh, you know, rather than rather than try to do that in real time, we'll send out an email to to, to folks. But probably um, looking at uh, the um, the week of, early in the week of the twenty fifth, I think is probably the. Um, uh, so, you know, some, you know, if Monday the 25th or something along those lines might be, uh, so we will send that out and we will send out to, so Jen, I see your comment. We'll send the list, uh, the ranking out to, to folks. So I'm a chair, so I can't move one way or the other. However, uh, if there's nothing competing Wednesday, the 20th at this time frame seems to be, this time frame seems to work for most of the folks on the committee. So uh, meeting a few days before that last week, I don't think tips it one way or the other, the sooner that we actually get to sit down and discuss and talk, we'll probably give people a little time to digest and be ready for the final decision needs on uh, November 3rd. So that's my thought. If anyone has any others, please let us know. Uh, Great, and I will check with Kate and Eileen as to where the uh, you know where where things will be at that point. Okay.
Um, Sorry, there are any other, is there any other input on that one? Okay. Marvin, do you want to do the next one? Uh, well, first, yes. Uh, uh, first, I wanted to acknowledge that we understand that this is a period of transition. Uh, some of the frustration that I have and has been expressed by other committee members is we're not being, we're not part of the transition. We're not being included in the, what is the formation of the authority as it's been. We're not being sought for counsel. We're not keep being kept updated on what steps have been taken and what the, and, and what the options could be or may be. I, just think that needed to be reiterated and made clear in the notes that that's where we're moving from. We want to get better at uh, being part of the process that is this authority. Uh, so that leads us to our next uh, area. Um, there are a lot of uh, updates surrounding the authority. Uh, we met some new people. Uh, on your agenda, there's uh, some bullet points. Uh, they're not in any particular order, but I do know folks are very, uh, we'd like to hear about the housing vouchers. Uh, like to know more about where the pit count is and if there's a plan for the severe weather sheltering of folks within the county for that will we'll ramp up and start up, you know, during this period of transition. Uh, and then uh, sharing which uh, the sub-regional planning and, and if there's anything new on the budgets, because I know there's a large amount of money coming from different places that the authority has to uh, jump into the wonderful budget seasons folks have uh, for funding. And so, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, Catherine, I see your I see your hand. Are you, um, and now I don't. Catherine, you good? I'm sorry. I'm monitoring monitoring the chat, and just a few comments have come through. Um, Bill Kirk Kirkland. Um, stated that Marvin said the window of time remained open for public comment. He wants to know if that's so. Also, um, also Barbara states, it appears that you are suggesting that this year the 60 programs are given because of the NOFO work has been done ahead of their COC, really starting the function. Maybe the COC needs to know that next year going forward, they will be part of the review and development of the NOFO early on so they can better understand all of the programs, their value, et cetera. Then the COC will be comfortable supporting them. It appears that this year they do not have the time to really understand the programs and provide input. It's a difficult situation. Thanks, Catherine. So uh, just on the, on the public comment, the public comment period was 10, 10 minutes at that time. And we moved on and kept it open for that period. But it, it, I, it's not my understanding that that was open on an indefinite basis that, you know. Um, um, I know, wasn't clear. I, you know, Marvin, you, t you tell me what, you know. Well, we that's, didn't set no time limit. I wasn't clear. And, and Shanae's right, we didn't set a time limit. So, 
So if somebody wants to talk, then let them talk. That's where we're at. These are the people that we want to hear from anyways, is the public, not all these extra people. That's the voice of the people. That's what we're here for. So if somebody is in public chat that wants to talk, you're more than welcome. Um, me and Marvin are letting you know that you can have the floor to speak. Say or do whatever you want. Like this is an area. So... I don't know how we would do that, uh, Peter. Well, you you know you can you can reopen public comment. Do I yeah, know? Peter and them told us that at the beginning that we can do whatever we wanted with the public comment. That was just the routine, right, and the regular stuff. That if we felt that we needed a longer time or changed it around to a different time that we put in the agenda, that that was all something we were able to move around and complete. I'm focused on this Thanks, Renee. So uh, can we open public comment for the uh, two? Uh, I don't know, Catherine, how many people were wanted to speak? Looks like Bill. Just Bill. Bill right now. Yes. I would offer that we open, reopen public comment. Okay. Um, yeah, Bill needs to speak. And again, I'm sure there's okay. a lot of things like We would like to open public comment at this time. Um, Bill, I'm going to allow you to talk. Um, so I'm unmuting you now. You should be able to speak at this time. Um, thanks. This is Bill Curlin Hackett. I've never had such a big argument before any public comment I've ever made about me giving comment. Thank you. Thank you, Marvin. I, I will be brief. Um, I listened to the system explanation by Peter. Thank you. Um, one thing I've learned since I've been doing this in the, since the start of the 10 year plan is you are all gonna have to learn about all the other permutations, which I mean by that, I mean the governing board or governing committee, the implementation board and your own work, because otherwise you are not gonna keep up to speed um, and it will take work from your part. And so many of you are somewhat new to this quagmire of a system and I wish you well, but I will encourage you to sit through every one of those other meetings that you can sit through because the reality is unless you do that, you will fall behind and you need to succeed as much as anybody else does. And so I'm wishing you well, but I'm just encouraging you. I sit through those meetings. So I'll be in the audience with you, at least as many of them as I can. So that's the only way to really get informed and to be as smart as you can possibly be as you evaluate what's before you. And yes, you're behind. Um, I certainly appreciate that. And I encourage you, uh, ask for everything you need. Um, just be bold about it, thanks. Thank you so much, Bill. I appreciate your time. I got my hand up. I, nobody sees it. I see it. Yeah, I, I just want you to know that to me, that felt like a blow. It felt uh, harmful the way it was stated. And uh, it's always, we are always told that we are behind or or we don't matter or we can't catch up or we won't be able to do it and blah 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 and I just want you to know that that felt like a sock in the stomach and I didn't appreciate it at all because I'm not behind and if I am it's because King County and other systemic white supremacist racist organizations haven't made sure that I was up to speed in a timely manner. So I beg your part. Thanks, Karen. Um, okay, so uh, Marvin, you wanna keep uh, public comment open or do you wanna close it back up again? Well, if there's nobody else waiting, I'd go ahead and close it and okay. then we can Probably get yeah, we're done. Thank you. Order. Okay. Um, so let you know. Um, uh, just to run through the topics that um, that Marvin uh, uh, outlined. Um, so we have a you know we have a so Alexis um, uh, was here earlier. Uh, she's presented and will come back and present, but she is our sub regional planning manager. She has been out engaging with stakeholders across the county. She's talked with over 250 organizations who completed six all day 
city visits. We've met with city councils, with uh, service provider organizations, um, you know, lived experience folks, uh, advocates, community-based organizations, a lot of different folks. She's come up with, uh, we have some draft uh, snapshot reports that she's going to come back and present to the advisory committee to, sh you know, to, to like go through what we see on the regions and, and you know, where those uh, where those look, but you know, there's been a, a lot of sort of fact finding and gathering of information right now, and we'll have a pre full presentation at the next advisory board on the on those snapshot reports from from some regional planning. On the budget, we are um, we're in that we're in those budget processes right now. This is the first time that we've done this, you know, from the uh, from the King County Regional Homelessness Authority. So you know, a little bit of a learning curve. Usually, I think, you know, some of the presentations of budget materials would have happened earlier. But so we've, you know, seen the city mayor's budget, the city council will be working on that uh, as well. And uh, we will have a full presentation at the November meeting based on, you know, what, what we have at that time. Okay, so we don't, you know, we're still, we're still working with them on, you know, what that's gonna look like and what our, but we do have uh, a much clearer picture of the amount of uh, contracts and the programs that are be gonna be coming to us from, uh, from the city and the county and working, you know, we're, we are building out the, the infrastructure to take those on as, as we're, you know, as we're building out the budget for them. So there's, uh, we'll have a better picture in November of what the, what the actual budget will look like, we'll have, you know, the ability to, um, so we have the, you know, we won't really have the budget finalized from the city of Seattle, I think until December, but, um, but we'll have a, you know, we'll have a better picture of what that looks like. King County budget probably won't change because they're on a two year, uh, two year budget cycle. So that one's a little easier. We're still working with HUD and with the, with the city and county on exactly what's going to come over from the continuum of care portfolio. Sorry, Karen, do you have a, yeah, I want to I want to follow up on what I just stated. I want to say that um, also, you know, these funds and this game that's being played, where we're bringing uh, people with lived experience to the table to say that we have a relationship with community when we know that we don't, because these funds, who do they suit? Whose pockets do they line? And who does who does it pay? It doesn't pay the people that's living on the street. Okay, it pays all these people that say they're doing this work and they're not doing this work. Okay, and they don't want us. They really don't want us here. And they don't want to hear my voice. They don't want to hear my anger, my emotion, or my passion about what I'm about and what I'm trying to do. But it's very crucial. Okay, it's crucial that we look at the people that are dying from this. The people that are dying from poor health care, drug abuse, overdose, whatever, because they lost hope, because they didn't think anybody believed in them. Okay? So that's where I'm coming from. Anybody who doesn't understand my passion, I have every right to feel like I feel and to say what I say, because what I'm saying is absolutely the truth. This system has suited itself for far too long, and I'm calling BS on it. Every time I hear any BS, I'm gonna call it out. I'm gonna bring forth the elephant, elephant in the room, which is white supremacy and racism and comfortability. Because if you say you're doing this work, I wanna know, what are you willing to give up? Are you willing to give up your job? I don't think so. Are you willing to give up your home? Are you willing to give up your nice neighborhood and your comfortability to say, oh, I house somebody, I house, no, you ain't house nobody until you make sure that person could thrive on their own and their self-worth and dignity was regained. So that is the work. That is the scope of the work. All this fluff talk and all these papers and data and numbers and counts, to me, that ain't nothing. That's not the most important. The most important is making sure that everybody can thrive and everybody can take care of themselves 
and not have to lean to Uncle Sam or the county or the city or the program or the system to get by. That's why I say what I say. It's not personal. I'm passionate because I speak the voice of the people on the street who don't believe that they matter. Thank you, Karen. Chris, so, you, you get your hands up. We got a few hands up. Thank you, Karen. I do, yes. Uh, thank you, Karen. I understand quite a bit more about the passion that you bring to these meetings after having sat in uh, that diversion training with you. And I'm glad that you speak about this because I, when people find out that I'm a member of this advisory board for King County Regional Housing Authority, I'm now met with disgust. Oh, I am so tired of hearing about that. And my heart sinks. And I don't know how many of you have watched the mayoral debates recently. We have no allies with either Bruce Harrell or Lorena Gonzalez. Both uh, are people of color. Uh, Bruce Harrell was a leading voice with the Compassion Seattle, which we didn't talk about in here. We weren't let to talk about in here. I remember bringing that up in a meeting and that was, uh, you know, hush, hush, don't talk about that. And Lorena doesn't like us either. So here's our next mayor that's already, we're already co-opted. Well, we're turning over this money for regional housing authority and this huge budget to these people. We don't even know what they're doing. Well, we don't really even know what we're doing either. So I feel the frustration as well. We need some strong leadership. We're just barely forming a coalition of like-minded people who are come from so many disciplines and walks of life. And we want to grasp hands and march forward in this endeavor. I mean, here's cardiac patient over here going, blah, 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 blah. Should I even get passionate about this? But this is a passion. This is not just a day job. We're here because this is a passion for us. And with what are we going to do when we got a mayor that doesn't really like us, no matter who's going to get in? Our one person that's going to be on the board, I think, in Council City seat number nine, God bless her, is Nikita Oliver. We need to really back her. Uh, Nikita Oliver her. uses they, them pronouns. Last I checked. Pardon me? Nikita Oliver uses they, them pronouns, not she, her. Thank you. We're missing the bigger point there. Nikita Oliver is going to be our biggest advocate. Um, I will try to be more fair-minded in my use of pronouns, but right now that's not the issue I'm trying to get across these, but I appreciate you. Teach me. I'm a boomer. Teach me. Whenever I hear you say that's not the issue you're trying to get across, I feel like you're not implementing queer justice in your work, and I feel like you're separating the two, and I really don't feel Okay, what's, what's the point I'm trying to get across, Louise? I know that you're talking about how we don't have allies on city council and how we do need more allyship and more um, folks who do care about housing equity and housing justice. But I feel like misgendering somebody and then rolling over it as though it's a separate issue is not productive to our work. It is a separate issue. And I did mention somebody that was an ally and you did not acknowledge that at all. So I, once again, Racial equity and queer equity should both be interwoven in the work and not seen as separate issues. They are intertwined. And I ask for forgiveness Thank and you did not acknowledge that either. You're absolutely right. I'm old school. I'm I think that I would like acknowledgement that it is important I, before I, forgiving you. I think that I would need to make sure that we were on the I same have page. acknowledged you three times now, please. If you've been listening to what I'm saying, you can look at the transcript. I've acknowledged my error. I don't know what else I can do other than uh, crucify myself, which is a little dramatic of me, but you are absolutely right. And I am learning just as we all are. So Lise, please um, take the hair shirt off and I will uh, keep going uh, with my point about Nikita Oliver. They are the person that we need to wine and dine to get on our side for the 
what we're coming together for as a board is to try to implement housing for people who need housing. I am not at all certain that either of our mayoral candidates, whoever it's going to be, is going to be a great ally for us. So it's going to be up to us, this board here that, that's meeting and trying to learn our tasks. Um, one of the things that I'm sure Marvin was going to bring up is, according to our charter, Peter, we're supposed to be meeting with the Implementation and Governance Board twice every calendar year. I'd like that addressed. We don't have to do that now. We can play that for the next agenda, but it's now a bug in your it's ear. It's on this agenda near the oh, end. Oh, thank you, Marvin. See, I knew you have it. I knew you have my back there, so thank you. But <laughs> I'm wondering how we, how we get to this place where we got mayors that don't want us. We got people on the street that are disgusted with us as an advisory board with this new King County Regional Housing Authority. Where, do, where the hell do we go? If we can't go with each other to form a coalition, what do we do? So well, I'll thank simply you, off, thank I'll you, simply Karen, for bringing up what you did, what you, what you brought up as far as your passion. That's my passion too right now today. Thank you. I, I love the passion. Uh, the basic question still exists is that we don't have a space now where we talk about the politics or the public narrative in which is homelessness is viewed. And it's a powerful place for us to work from, but we're not going to get it today. I do still want to get back to getting an update because guess what? We don't know. What's the total budget for the King County Regional Homeless Authority? We know where about 60 million of it's coming from. What else is being asked for? What will the authority actually have in terms of funding moving forward? That was the, the whole key for the budget piece because somewhere in there, we're going to get down to the emergency housing vouchers, but I'd like to get an answer to what the budget is. What are we asking yeah. from Seattle? What are we asking from King County? What are the other municipalities chipping in? And what are, what are going to be their expectations of us as we move forward with a regional response? Yeah. Because that narrative does not play everywhere in the same way. So no, you're, you're absolutely right about that. And I think one of the things that, um, so, you know, among the, the data that were gathered to sort of help inform the sub regional plans were what the, what those other municipalities are spending on, you know, through contracting. And there's a bunch of data that was gathered there that, that is, you know, really rich and interesting. Those folks are not contributing to the King County Regional Homelessness Authority and it's homelessness, not housing. Um, I know it's an easy mistake to make, but everybody, you know, um, there are housing authorities, there's a not us. But um, so what we've got right now is uh, just under 70 million in contracts that are coming from the city of Seattle and just under 50 million in contracts that are coming from King County. Um, those are coming over in about 200 contracts with about 50 service providers. Um, but we are, uh, you know, we're still looking at exactly, you know, all of, all of the, the, the extra variables there. In terms of asks, uh, that's not the structure of the budget that we've got this year. More it's like tells, you know, and like, you know, we're going to be building out the ask portion next year. There is some, you know, there is some money that we're going to be looking at that is, you know, not yet programmed or is coming and it has a little bit more flexibility in terms of the um, ARPA dollars that the city, the, uh, the emergency uh, uh, monies that came to the city and the county. Um, and we're, we are hopeful that that will come to us that is a little more unstructured and we can, we can lay out and, you know, say, okay, this is the way we want to go. We do have some, you know, some plans to lay out new programming. You know, one of the key goals that Mark has laid out for us is to build a peer navigation model that would use, you know, folks of lived experience to build that out and come, you know, come, come in and support folks. So that's a, you know, that is one of the, the things that Mark has laid out uh, among the, the goals that we have. Another is to build out uh, an actual by name list where, you know, we actually know everybody who's experiencing homelessness in the region. We know what their, what their housing goals are, what they're, what they're asking for. Um, that is not something that we have right now. And the third is to, is to build out uh, a real inventory of interim solutions for folks that, that is not the sidewalks and the streets and the parks. So, you know, those are all things that are gonna take money. 
the money's got to come from, you know, we got to, we got to, we got to map those out. But right now we're still in the sort of build the infrastructure, build the financial management system and the grants <laughs> management system to hold these new contracts, get staffed up and get, you know, get going with stuff. So, you know, I, I hear, you know, I, I, I will, I accept all the feedback that you've got. And Karen, you know, I'm, I'm, I want you here and I want, you know, you can direct your anger at me. You can direct your passion at, at this work. I'm, you know, I, I need your voice here. So, you know, please don't ever feel like that's a perspective that you got from us. And, you know, I think, you know, one of the things that I'll say is like, you know, I'm coming from an environment where the, the regional homelessness authority that I was working with had been in place for 25 years, had been the continuum of care lead. I've not been in a position where I had to build one, you know, from like, you know, a pile of lumber. And so, you know, like we don't have everything that we would, that I would want. I don't have all the structures in place or the folks, the arms and legs to kind of get, you know, as connected with you all as we will. But I, you know, and I, and I've approved, you know, all your feedback is valid. I'm not, I'm not suggesting that any of it is wrong. And, uh, you know, I would want you to, like, a, you know, like has, has been said, a little bit of grace in this moment where we do, you know, we just don't have the arms and legs or the structure. If it look, you know, there is no bad will here. I trust you guys and I'll tell you what, you know, what I think. I don't, you know, and we're going to build a lot of this stuff as we go forward together. So I just, you know, get, if you would offer us at the authority and our partners at the city and county, just, a, you know, a, a few more minutes. I know it's been, it's dragged on quite a bit, but for us, we're still, you know, we're in the process of like getting the, getting the wheels on the thing and getting, and getting it moving, um, which is a long winded way. Of well, I just want to say, you know, the system, the system has been harming my people for years. Yeah. So, you know, I, I understand you saying, uh, you know, you guys aren't steady on your feet yet. I get that. But I'm just saying, systemically, this has been going on for years. My yeah. people were slaves and built this country and, and, and received no profit. We're not profiting. I'm angry at the people who are profiting and who are comfortable and who are lying when they say that Black Lives Matter or Indigenous Lives Matter. I'm, I'm angry about that. That hurts. There's yeah. too many people dying, Peter. It's not personal. It's not about you. It's not about Mark. Hell, they're gonna use, they're gonna hang all this on Mark. I, I feel sorry for Mark and I realize why Regina Cannon bowed out. This is a hell of a job, a hell of a task to take on. Because in reality, we already know that there's a lot of people who don't want any change. So, you yeah. know, I feel you. I hope you feel me. I hear I do, Karen, you know, I'm, I, you know, none of, I'm, I don't disagree with any of what you said, although we are going to say we are going to build a better system. I, I guarantee you that. And we're going to work together on it and we are going to save lives. And I, you know, we're not, not all of them, but we are going to, we are going to do better than we did. And I, I hear you about the, you know, the sort of risks that we're running, but we, the risk of not doing what we're doing is, is worse. We can't leave it the way it's been. Um, okay, so you asked, so emergency housing vouchers was one of the things that Marvin, you came, you came back to. So we have, um, as you know, we sent out the agreements to the providers. Most of them have signed it and got back. Somehow, you know, we're still kind of going back to a few to like, you know, some of them are a little hesitant because there's no money for services, which is a fair, a fair, you know, uh, criticism and we've we've asked the city and the county to come up with money to fund services we um, at this point we have I think there were 87 uh, referrals that came through uh, coordinated entry prioritization um, the CEA team said that there were up to 256 uh, referrals transmitted so far um, they're running at about 30 a day at this point um, they're coming in 
At first, I will tell you that we were not getting very many referrals coming in from the service providers. It was a little slow. So, you know, and, and I don't like to, I don't like to use like, you know, threats and coercion, but we, you know, in the end we said, okay, we're going to have to put a deadline. We need a deadline. So we set a deadline in and then folks started, started making the referrals. So, I mean, I don't like to do it, but you know, sometimes I mean, it, 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 it did work. So it's a little, you know, it's hard to argue with sort of results at this point, we got referrals coming in. Um, and uh, the vouchers are being issued. I don't think anybody has actually leased up yet. So, uh, so that's sort of the, you know, the status of it. We're hopeful that we're going to get budget for service funding, but that's, you know, there's not a, there's not a full commitment there yet. But the, but the city had six million dollars. I think you all saw in the in the mayor's budget for uh, for services, which would support, you know, which would support a lot. Um, um, you mentioned you talked about severe weather. So the there is just you know really, there has been just really there. quickly on the yeah. on, on the housing vouchers. Yeah. I think Tamra asked earlier how how is that connection being made? Is there only one avenue of approach? for the housing vouchers or how is that being uh, being produced? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Them. Okay, so, so all right, so I'm gonna, this is a refresher because we, this is not, so this is a refresher. So we, what, the agreements that we had, there were uh, essentially sort of four different pathways. One of them was the way, was ordinary coordinated entry prioritization. Folks are in that, in that queue, right? Now, but the way that that's functioned, there wasn't enough people to get to everybody. So we said, okay, second pathway was permanent supported housing, people who have met their housing stability goals, they're ready to move out of their supportive housing unit, you know, that, you know, so, you know, maybe they've been there five years, something like that, you're in a state of, of recovery from whatever issues caused you to need those depth of supports, you're ready to move out of there. But you need, you know, you need the rental support. So that's where the vouchers would come in. This was a recommendation from the Lived Experience Coalition to come, you know, to, to do this. So we put that out to the, the permanent supportive housing providers. You can refer people into this program, free up the unit, let them move out into community. So then we have a, you know, high, high service, you know, unit for people who are in real challenges out on the streets. That was the second pathway. The third pathway was something that we used to use in Los Angeles, but it's called reverse matching. And it, it means that, you know, A, look, I don't have the services. I, don't, I can't fund you the services to, to cover new people, but you are working with people now who you have a case management, you know, you have folks that you're working with, you have case managers who are working with them, you know their housing needs, target, you know, like, like if folks could, you know, do okay in rapid rehousing, let's try rapid rehousing. If folks need permanent supportive housing, so they need a wraparound services that we can't provide with the emergency housing vouchers, that's not a good fit. But the people who are in between where rapid rehousing is not a good fit because you need long-term financial support, but you might not need all the services that are available in permanent supportive housing. This is the kind of people, you know, it's like people who are like long-term stayers in shelter, for example, they get stuck there because there's, they're not really a good fit for permanent supportive housing. So they're never going to be prioritized for the few PSH slots like that. But rapid housing is not going to do because they can't hold on the rent after the rapid housing is done. Those are folks, this is a good fit for because they can meet their housing goal, you know, they can achieve a stable tenancy without, you know, the depth of support. So that's the, that's the kind of framing and the targeting we've given out to providers. You know the folks you're working with, you know. Now, I mean, I would love to be able to give a voucher to everybody who's income eligible and like hopefully if Maxine Waters bill goes through and like we actually have that level of vouchers that change a game changer. But until we have that, we need to focus this resource on that kind of. So that's what we've said. Like you bring well, the. I, 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 can I say something really quick about that, Peter? Too. The thing is, is that you know it's not about uh, checking the boxes and fitting into the program, and then that's it because you don't qualify because you can't uh, take care of yourself. It's I'm asking uh, the change to be 
that the King County Regional Homeless Authority stops using those models that haven't worked. Uh, stop using rapid rehousing. Stop using all of those things that have not worked because they're only temporal. They only work temporarily. They're not sustainable. And I'm asking that we do more to be supportive of the person or persons or family that we are housing. Yeah. Meaning, get them up to speed as far as learning how to support, like offering jobs, like offering, uh, you know, uh, money management program services, mental health, health care, and all that they need. We can't just attack the one need and forget about the other needs that keep making, allowing for the recidivism to continue to happen and they end up back in our office six months or a year later. That's what I want to, that's what I really want to see the Regional Homeless Authority attack. All right. I, I appreciate that, Karen. I like, so, so, Christina, I see your hand. And I'm sorry, I saw that before, so I apologize. Is there a way we could get the numbers to those four categories? Like, you know, 10% are in one, 40% in two, you know, that <laughs> kind of, that kind of thing? I wish I could tell you because I wish they would have told me, right? So like one one problem is we're we're we we didn't get clear numbers from folks of how many they could do in this category or the other. We thought that CEA prioritization would be about a hundred. I sent out a survey to all of the PSH providers and said, tell us how many, you know, if you keep a wait list, tell us how many people are on the wait list. If you don't, can you estimate? And if you can't estimate, can you ask your people and find out how many? Just give, you know, give us some kind of a range. I got about half of them to reply and they said something like 300. And yet, you know, we haven't seen those numbers yet. So I, my guess is that most of them are going to come through that other pathway that we call reverse matching. So, you know, like, I think maybe the PSH side is going to trickle in over time. Because I, I know, you know, I did a program like this when I ran the housing authority, uh, Section 8 for the city housing authority in, in Los Angeles. We had the shelter plus care portfolio. And so, mm -hmm. you know, the folks, you know, I was like, okay, well, let's give those folks a voucher, a Section 8 voucher, so that they can move on when they're ready, right? So you've been there for five years. Maybe some, some of those people have been there 10 years. You know, they were ready, but they, um, so it, it, when we first did that, it took a while for folks to kind of get comfortable with the idea. And there were folks who came in and applied and then they didn't actually go out and search. They came and applied again. So there were folks who took like two or three times to just feel like, okay, I can do this, you know? So it might, I don't know, but like based on that experience, it may, it may just take a little bit of time. But my guess is that most of them are going to come through that third pathway. And then the fourth pathway was reverse matching, but not with the homeless services providers, but instead with the domestic violence and human this. trafficking providers, because we yeah. reached out to them as well. Through the Coalition on Ending Gender-Based Violence, we connected with those folks. Okay. So, you know, my guess is if I had to put numbers to it, I'd probably say something like, uh, you know, 80, 80 85% are going to come through reverse matching you know, you know, five, 10 percent coming from CEA and, you know, five, 10 percent coming through uh, PSH. If that's, you know, but I, I don't quite know, you know, to be to be honest with you. I would have predicted it different at the start, but now I'm not. Now I'm a little less cheerful about those other pathways. On the other hand, I feel like, you know, the, the um, reverse matching and Karen, I hear you about, about the program, you know, the program depth and the building out models that support people fully. So, Christine, your hand is still up. Do you, did you, was there something else? No, I just, it, it, follow up on that. Then how do we, so then when we think about where the need is, then we think of the need in the category of reverse matching. Is that need hitting the people on the streets that actually um, are in need, if that yeah. makes sense. Are we getting to the most need using step number three? So I, I really appreciate that perspective. So part of the challenge for me is in this, for this resource, it's not clear. I mean, like on some level, it's like everybody who's unhoused 
you know, but we did, you know, you all gave input, the lived experience coalition gave input, other folks gave input that we really wanted to focus on a BIPOC folks and B unsheltered folks. And then there were, you know, a bunch of other things, you know, Jesse was very, very focused on people who had criminal justice backgrounds or other things that came in, but so the guidance we gave folks is on focus on unsheltered folks. You know, this is not just for, you know, folks who are in your other programs. And in fact, we said to the transitional housing providers that, you know, you're, they're not eligible for referrals into this. The second thing was that we're still using COVID prioritization. And that was an agreement with, you know, that everybody focused on. And that is um, the people who are at greatest risk of catching COVID and severe disease from COVID, which is BIPOC folks which is seniors and folks who have other uh, health conditions and it's, it's pregnant women. So those are the, those are the categories. And so like, you know, the more of those, the higher, you know, COVID prioritization that you get to, but we really, we, we, we stressed to the providers that the focus is on um, unsheltered folks that they're working with. Now, not everybody is working with shel unsheltered folks. So, you know, sheltered providers, obviously they're gonna, they're gonna be working with who they work with, which is the folks who are in their shelters. Um, Thank you, Peter. Uh, do we have enough, uh, we're gonna run short on time here shortly. I'm sorry. Uh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. To extend the meeting, uh, but we still have the pit. I know the severe weather shelter, what, what uh, I've heard nothing, so. And yeah, so we we're really interested in where where we were going to put. Yeah. Did we bring so, up did we bring up diversion? Say again. Did we bring up diversion? Not yet. Yeah, I think um, diversion should go before the before the count. Uh, severe weather was what I pitched. If you would like us to talk about diversion. First, uh, I, I'm not opposed, but it's I'll not be, on our agenda. Yeah, I'll be candid. I don't have I don't have much to say on the on the topic of diversion. It is among the categories of programming that we're going to be getting. You know, I think it's a key. There's reason. a lot of other people in the room besides you, Peter. I'm sorry. I thought he was asking me for updates. You're, my apologies. No, 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 no. no. I'm talking about us. Because diversion uh, centers the client and, and uh, centers their culture and their lineage and where they come from. And yep. it uh, reaches out to all the things that I've been talking about. And I think that we all need to go through diversion training. Uh, I think it's very important for people to understand the biases and the differences and the racism and all that stuff. That I was that I keep talking about. Shanae, can you help me? Well, how about uh, Shanae, if you want to speak, please. If not, I wrote it down because I too think that diversion is a, a big one. But we have a couple points that other folks on the committee really ask that we try to address. Uh, we can put diversion on our agenda and have hopefully much better, uh, much more conversation on it. Uh, but I wanted to go back to Peter. Can we get an update on severe weather shelters and whether or not they're going to be operating this year as we move into the colder parts of the year? So they are they are going to be operating. We are going to you know, we are the authority is going to be taking those on in January, like the rest of the portfolio. So we are you know, we are coordinating closely with city of uh, Seattle um, parks is the you know, is the key one. They have Office of Emergency Management and Human Services. Um, we hired Paul Tam, who, who is actively coordinated with the South King County providers uh, to facilitate and convene their uh, severe weather response. And we met with dozens of North King County leaders and providers to talk about a se severe weather response in those areas. Because I think City of Seattle has a has an infrastructure. They've had a contract, a set of contracts in place. They've had a process. Rest of the county, it's not been at all clear how they're deployed. So one of the things we want to make sure is that on all of the subregions, there is a there is a strategy, there is there is, you know, there will be a, a severe weather response. Um, okay, there will be a response for yes. South King County 
get is probably very underrated when it comes to having a response unless there's a blizzard outside. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, that's all stuff that we want to work through and make sure that there is a response in each region. So Ben, ben I, see, I see your hand. Yeah, I had, um, I had made the pitch to, to get this on there. I think, I don't think that a region has ever really had like a regional infrastructure support um, to provide like technical assistance for, you know, particularly like smaller communities like here in Burien, um, it's, it's often, it's like the local church and they do, you know, they're doing a great job, but I, I think it would be really amazing. I know, I know there's already a lot on KCRHA's plate, um, but having a central source of, of TNA, of, of TA, of, um, you know, some, some coordination and everything I think could be just really, really helpful to the region. I, I couldn't agree more. And I, I'm, I'm, we're eager to take this on. And, and like, I definitely think it's one, it's one of the areas where there's like really severe distress, uh, you know, experienced by people. Like it's, it's cold here. It's wet. I mean, you know, and th those are really dangerous conditions. I think that, you know, even as we experience climate change and we get, you know, we're going to get, you know, we're going to get summer days like like some of the ones we saw this summer where those are lethal. Those are lethal days. And we got to have, a, you know, we got to have infrastructure for cooling. There are smoke, you know, conditions when the fires come in where, you know, there, you know, we have people with respiratory uh, challenges that, you know, really shouldn't be outside. And, you know, so all of those different things go into the mix. And I agree with you. We would like to set up a technical expertise center that provides the assistance to the regions and make sure that there is some kind of coverage. I think the, the cities have all, you know, no one, no one denies that this is a need. They're all just sort of like not quite knowing what to do. And the city of Seattle, like I said, has depth and there's a, there's an infrastructure there, but we want to make sure, cause there's, there are, you know, there are collaborations that are happening like in North County where several cities have come together and said, okay, you do this part, you do this part, you do this part. And I think those are the kinds of collaborations that we can draw on to set up infrastructure for this. So I appreciate the, the charge and we definitely want to take that on. I also, you know, I want to acknowledge like we're, we're growing, you know, we're growing, we're growing fast, but, you know, as, as we staff up, we have people with expertise to do that. That's a, that is an area that we want to take on. Um, um so so we are going to do them and that's good uh be very interesting to see if the if they'll roll out as they have in the past or if there are any meaningful changes to actual coverage or needs especially in the south and the east yeah. where in the past there's been no structured emergency so one of the response. one thing i would can, can I ask you guys to, um, through the through the chairs, can you guys, you know, if you have recommendations along those lines of things that we should think about and focus on, if you could forward those, um, forward those, that would be really helpful to us, okay? Will do. Um, so in our last couple minutes, we uh, pit count, are we doing one? We're not doing one. So, you know, my concern on this is just like, they, you know, we are still in a significant COVID situation and there is a, there's a real, there's a real risk. I don't see this as being a better situation than we had last year. And, you know, to me, I don't, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't make a ton of sense to do one. I do think we need to rethink. I mean, I don't, I've not heard anybody have, you know, express satisfaction and, and like, yeah, this, this is an accurate count. I've, no, I've not heard anybody say, that the way we've done things, you know, accurately captures the number of people who are out there. So I think that what we collectively need to do is redesign the way that the pit functions and plan for a more robust, better pit count next year rather than doing, doing one this year. So I'll offer this, Peter, it would have been great to start this conversation off of letting folks know that HUD simply required a sheltered count for this year coming up and how that shelter count would be gathered. And then whether or not, if we as a committee want to start putting our roots down and trying to say, what do we, what do we want from a true count? Yeah. Is it accuracy? Is it coverage? You know, is it community building? You know, those are, I, I agree, are the okay. other questions for a robust conversation, but knowing what is required or what's on the table. Is My apologies. A place to start conversation. My apologies. 
My apologies, Marvin, you're, you're absolutely right. We, every community is required to do a sheltered count every year. So that's, I, I, you know, I, I, you know, I, I don't want to make assumptions that like everybody's aware of that. So my apologies for not leading with that. We are all, all of every community is required to do that. And there's a, you know, the expectation is that everybody can capture that through their HMIS. Now that's not always true because not every provider who offers shelter participates in HMIS, you know, often uh, for example, missions don't and, and churches that have shelter programs there are some government programs that don't participate in HMIS that provide uh, motel vouchering programs and things like that. So, but, but yes, there is no question that we will conduct a sheltered count because that's required of every continuum every year. So there's no, there's no, there wouldn't be any getting around that. That's just part of the way. The, re, the question I, I took to mean about the street count or the unsheltered count um, and that's a different kind of thing. So uh, I, see, I see two hands. I see Robin. I know we're at time, but Robin, I see your hand and Sherry, I see your hand. Robin, you go. Yeah, I just wanted to say, um, I, I can't speak to the details of the pit count in terms of its function and all of that, Like, um, but um, my, my work is in disability advocacy and um, the reports that come out as a result of the point in time counts um, <laughs> leave much to be desired in the sense of how disability is adequately and accurately conveyed um, it, to the point actually where the most recent uh, pit report I saw, the 2020 report, actually omitted uh, percentages related to the total number of unhoused people who experience disabilities. So um, I know we don't have time right now, but I would really like to make sure that however the pit count happens, including uh, any of the shelter related counts, that the disability data component is thoroughly thought through and I'm okay. more than happy to help with that process. Thank you, that's really helpful. So uh, Owen uh, Kefaz, who is the deputy chief of community impact for the authority has responsibility for this area and he's gonna be coming back to, you know, to talk through the way that those are gonna be done. So it would be really, so each of you that has a, like, a, the, you know, the, the expertise and the focus area in those things, like let's, let's think through the deficiencies that you've seen in previous counts and bring forward what recommendations you'd have to, to sort of fill those and what, what those might look like. And, you know, there, you know, I've seen, I've seen lots of different ways of improving those, those numbers, particularly in terms of asking people about, you know, substance use disorders and things like that. People are often reticent, things like that. So, Sherry, can I get your question? Yeah. So um, again, you know, and trying to understand. Um, okay, so the point in count, so I'm hearing, hearing a little bit more. Um, so, like, so somebody, like, how do we do that? Like, somebody comes back to us and um, they go count, do, I mean, do the count or something, or we, like, I'm confused how we do that, if that makes sense. Thank you. So the, the actual mechanics of it, you know, is on the sheltered count, what happens is we send a survey out to the shelter operators that do not participate in HMIS, and we do pulls of information from HMIS for the shelter operators who, were, who participate in HMIS. So, you know, basically for those, for those two groups, you know, we sort of, you know, because because the folks who are not in HMIS, otherwise we wouldn't have any information. So we need to ask them to give us, you know, complete sets of information. And again, Robin, that's it. That's the kind of kind of the, the, the question that you just raised about the quality of the data. That's the kind of data that we would want to think through how we capture from, you know, from those folks. Right. How are we at, how are they how are they determining whether people have disabilities? How are they asking whether people have disabilities? Right. How are they asking whether people have veteran status? Those kinds of things. How are they determining gender? Those kinds of things. So those are all parts of, of what goes into uh, to building out account on this on the unsheltered street count. It's a much more complex undertaking. And we have to you know, we'll have to come come back and talk talk through how that would go. OK, so once that's done, then what do we do with that? So we, we just kind of dissect all this. I mean, like, what do we do with that? You know what I mean? Like once we get all that information. Um, well, so it, you know, it really depends on the community, but obviously for the purposes of planning, what we would want to do is, 
you know, use that information to inform the rest of what what's going on. And I think, you know, that's been one of the challenges with a pit count, particularly locally, is like if people don't have confidence in the number, then they don't they don't use the information for anything. We're required to do it. But if you don't feel like, you know, if people don't feel like it was a good set of information, then you don't lean hard on it and figure out like, OK, well, this is you know, this is the way we're going to use these information. So that's another thing. It's like, you know, we have confidence in the information that we're capturing so that, that you know, you can then use it for planning and, and, and for actually determining, you know, where resources go and the other kinds of things that we need to think about. But you would not have to like actually, you know, execute on that or, or like, you know, do, you know, it's not like you guys have to do the count. I mean, you, yes, when we call for volunteers to go out, that would be great, of course. And like, to the extent that folks can do that, that would be great. I know we're like now at five over time. So a lot of people had to go and I apologize for running over. Okay, so uh, the only thing that's left if people want to hold on just for a few more minutes, if we still uh, are, is it possible to schedule meetings with the implementation board and governing board before this year ends? Uh, yes, I think so. So I, I, I will, I need to check with, you know, let me go back and see when those are meeting and like talk to, you know, let's talk like you, you and, and Shanae and I, let's talk through, let's look at the calendar and, and like figure out what, what makes sense. But I, you know, I also got to, I also got to talk through with Mark how, you know, how they how they picture seeing the, the calendar roll out, because we could also do it, you know, first, you know, for I don't know if you mean like has to be in the calendar year or like a one year period, but we can let's you, let's add splitting hairs. If we can get one in, we need a practice session because we haven't met with either the other boards. When we attend their meetings, we're quiet spectators. This would be an open meeting with dialogue going both ways working with the other boards at the authority. So I think it's a crucial meeting. We really yeah. probably should get one in this year and then figure out a schedule for next year to make those connections, you know, kind of work with the way that the year will roll out work-wise for the authority. Here, here, well, well said, Marvin, yeah, at least. Okay, so let's, let's, let's sit some time through. And, and then, uh, yeah, ad hoc well, order meetings or amend the charter, however. Well, thank All right, you. let's set some time you, you uh, for for Shanae and, and yourself and, and and like let's talk that let's talk that through how we want it how, how we want okay. it. Okay. Yeah, that sounds great. Thank Thanks. You. I just want to clear up too. I don't have access to this King County um, email that y'all gave me. So for everybody, um, the best email is to use is my DSC email s colston at dsc.org. That way, I get it no matter what. Okay. Because well, I, I'm, I'm not getting stuff. I get stuff late and it's just not okay. I'll make sure that, that folks are. Thank so you. I. Okay. We'll, 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 I think we can work on that. Okay. okay. And so for the NOFO meeting, is the plan still for you to send out an email? Yeah. Let, so days and times? Let's, let's caucus on what, what makes sense. Okay. Sure. I'm, yeah. I need to check with them to make sure they're going to be done because otherwise there, there won't be. Yeah. Okay. Gotcha. That does make sense. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Isn't it, are there any other questions before we, we, I, I look for a motion to adjourn. We're good. <laughs> I think that I think the motion is happening. People are moving with their feet. They're voting with their feet. <laughs> They're running. Right. All right. Thank you. Everyone. Uh, all right. All right. Bye. 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 Talk to you soon, people. Thank you.